past project. Ohio Modern was a project of the Ohio State Historic Preservation Office and was largely funded by Preserve America grant. There were two separate segments to Ohio Modern, a statewide historic context and a historic survey. Today we'll be focusing only on the survey portion of Ohio Modern preserving our recent past. Quickly, I would like to introduce the survey team for the project, and it was comprised of Steve Avdikoff, Debbie Griffin, Kathy Maskane, and myself. We also had technical support from Susan Burnham, Allison Spiker, and Jimmy Wade. Moving on into the project itself, uh, the survey was comprised of the documentation of 500 properties on Ohio historic inventory forms and a comprehensive survey report. Communities within the scope of the survey included Dayton, Trotwood, Vandalia, Huber Heights, Fairborn, Kettering, Oakwood, Centerville, and small portions of Harrison, Washington, and Miami townships. Constructed between 1940 and 1970, the inventoried properties represented a wide variety of uses, such as residential, commercial, recreational, educational, governmental, and ecclesiastical. In addition to the various building types, the survey also included objects, sites, and structures. The various properties en encompassed a wide range of ages, construction materials, architectural details, and stylistic influences, all of which we'll describe further as the presentation moves along. The primary objective of the project was to provide a model for conducting research and survey of mid-20th century resources, thereby creating a better understanding of properties from the recent past. Other survey objectives included fostering an understanding of architectural and historical resources dating from 1940 to 1970 that may be typically found throughout Ohio creating a context for the application of the National Register criteria for mid-20th century properties, and raising awareness and appreciation for recent past resources in the greater Dayton area. Methodology for identifying the 500 OHI, OHI properties was comprised of countless hours completing multiple windshield surveys, some of them guided by city representatives, suggestions from city staff, historical societies, or other interested individuals, interviews with builders representing mid-20th century construction companies, research and historic photographs. This slide shows an example of a building that was identified for survey after a historic image was found in the city directory. And finally, for commercial properties, special identification, uh, excuse me, identification for commercial properties, special attention was paid to historic transportation corridors, such as this image of North Broadway in Fairborn, Ohio. Commencing with the year 1940, the survey period starts with Dayton's World War II manufacturing surge. Being an established industrial and aviation city, thousands of people flooded Dayton and its environs to work at the factories or Army Air Force installations. Beginning in the late 1930s, war-related products manufactured throughout the metropolitan region included munitions, rifles, military truck parts, and aircraft components. After World War II, many of the factory workers that had relocated to Dayton for employment remained in the metropolitan area. Joining them were returning veterans, which further, compli which further complicated and contributed to the region's acute housing shortage. Beginning in the late 1940s and lasting through the 1960s, a residential construction boom occurred throughout the metro area, rapidly converting undeveloped land into acres of subdivisions 
as seen in this slide of Centerville, Ohio, which was predominantly a rural, small village until after the war. The population and residential boom also resulted in an influx of new schools, libraries, churches, offices, and commercial buildings. In 1960, Dayton was Ohio's sixth largest city. However, for the first time in its history, the city would see a decline of inhabitants during the 1960s. Conversely, Montgomery County, where Dayton is located, its population increased by 15% during the same decade, and Fairborn in neighboring Greene County had a 66% gain. For a variety of reasons, people were choosing to live in expanding suburban and township subdivisions rather than the city. Completed in phases, the interstate highway system greatly facilitated the ability to live in the suburbs and commute several miles across town for work. Now we'll move on to the findings during the survey. And we'll start with residential. Over half of the properties inventoried for the Ohio Modern Dayton survey were residential buildings, ranging from mass-produced tract houses to high-style single-family houses. Commercial residential properties, such as duplexes and apartment buildings, were also included in the survey. Compared to pre-World War II housing, one of the most dominant defining features of the mid-20th century house is the garage. Moved up from the rear of the lot, garages became attached to the house. In addition to protecting the family's automobile, attached garages were also promoted as appropriate space for the family hobby, the family's hobbies, and as rainy day playrooms for the children, as seen in this image on the bottom left. Due to the hilly terrain, the garage sited below grade is common throughout the Dayton metropolitan area, as seen in the image on the bottom right. Carports were also popular for safeguarding the owner's car and were often used on modest ranch or tract houses for economical reasons. Documented carports ranged from a simple canopy attached to the side of the house, such as the image on the left, to carports contained within the roof line with built-in storage sheds, such as the image on the top right. Additionally, following in the earlier tradition of Frank Lloyd Wright, carports were also integrated into the design of modernist houses for aesthetic purposes, which you can see on the bottom right. Inventoried houses constructed during the 1940s tended to be Cape Cod house types or houses exhibiting period revival styles popular in the 1920s, such as Colonial Revival, Tudor Revival, and the French Colonial Norman Revival. During the 1950s, ranch houses were the predominant house type built in the Dayton metro area. The 144 ranch houses surveyed included basic examples without stylistic detail, such as the one in the top left, as well as examples with modernistic characteristics. As seen on several houses, the colonial revival style also persisted into the mid-20th century. Looking at the image on the bottom right, subtle colonial details were found, such as gable returns, shutters, multiple light windows, and octagonal attic vents, as well as lantern-style light fixtures in the yard. Ranch houses were built in a variety of shapes, including rectangular, L-shaped, T-shaped, V-shaped, and sometimes round, as seen in the bottom, or I'm sorry, the top right slide. While ranch houses continued to be fashionable in the 1960s, split levels gained in popularity during the decade. Split levels are comprised of a main two-story block with a one-story wing, which intersects at mid-story, creating three levels. With this house type, the lowest level is partially below grade. Split levels inventory during the survey project generally did not have an architectural style. However, we discovered by the late 1960s the trend of using applied details 
that hinted at historic architectural styles such as Swiss chalet and Tudor revival were becoming more commonplace. And those examples are seen in the two bottom images. Beginning in the early 1940s, Dayton area home builders led the charge for suburban expansion. In the post-World War II years, it was more common for a builder to take on the role of developer. For a broader understanding of mid-20th century housing, five builders were interviewed during the Ohio Modern Dayton Survey project. The interviews provided valuable information regarding common residential development trends, such as the evolution of designs, land acquisition, suppliers, and advertising. The interviews also yielded a range of house types from small tract houses for first-time buyers, such as the one in the upper left, to custom-built ranches and split levels built for second or third-time home buyers, such as the one on the bottom left. Additionally, a diverse range of subdivisions that ranged in scale from hundreds of houses to thousands, such as Huber Heights, were identified through the builder interviews. And now I will turn the presentation over to Debbie Griffin. Hi, I'm Debbie Griffin with Heritage Architectural Associates. I'm going to be um, showing you some of the non-residential styles that we encountered. Uh, we saw a number of styles in the survey. Uh, some predated the modern period of 1940 to 1970, and some were just getting started during that period and continued on <coughs> afterwards. Art modern, or streamlined modern as it's also called, is uh, um, was a common uh, style in the 40s and early 50s, characterized by curved corners, use of glass block, and smooth surfaces. Uh, we saw some of these in uh, offices, manufacturing facility type offices, which is the upper photo, and some schools and also retail. The international style, which started back in the 30s, was also still common into the 50s. Um, mostly in, building, in uh, public buildings, uh, government buildings, and schools. Brutalism, which was getting started toward the end of the period. Uh, the photo on the left is a post office. It's uh, characterized by boxy forms with rough concrete and thick masonry walls. The Miesian style uh, is characterized by glass curtain wall, rectangular form, and the ground story set back, as you can see in the photo on the right. Um, these were mostly in the 60s. They were all office buildings with this one high rise and several that were three to six stories high. The Googie style, um, the name comes from the um, LA area Googie coffee, Googie's Coffee Shop, which was built in 1949 and has now been demolished. Um, it is characterized by soaring roof lines with extreme cantilevers and a space age look. Uh, these were popular in the 50s and 60s and were used a lot in roadside type buildings to attract the passers-by. Restaurants, gas stations, movie theaters, entertainment type complexes. This is a movie theater in Kettering at the top. Um, the neo-expressionism style uh, features sculpted effects with sweeping curves. Um, this was a late 1960s and into 1970 in the surveyed buildings that we saw. This is a church. Um, actually, all the, the examples that we saw were churches in the survey. Um, it, this particular church also has some ele elements of brutalism with the large concrete piers. New formalism, which is characterized by symmetry and allusions to cl uh, classic classicism with the arches and columns. Um, was popular in the 60s and, and into 1970. We saw several good examples of this in the survey, as you can see here. The types of buildings were banks, offices, and educational facilities. Now we get to the more generic modern movements style. These were um, 
a large percent of the buildings we surveyed were fit in this category. Uh, they did not have a specific style uh, like we just talked about, but they definitely were modern with a variety of features, um, including in the feature just juxtaposition of materials, a lot of contrasts, and were found in all building types. I'm going to show you a series of photos that were taken from that were of buildings built from the 1950s to 1970, so you can see the progression of the styling. The first one was mid 50s and still has some international style features. Um, and then you get to the lower one in 1957 has the clerestory windows, the exposed rafter tails over the entrance. A retail store from 1960s see the low-pitched roof, a lot of use of glass, and large stone pier. An office building from 1962 with a drive-in underneath it, um, a large curtain wall entrance with a very prominent canopy. Here's another architect's office from 1965. Um, this, was, this upper left uh, picture is a drawing, of course, which gives a better view of it than you can see from the ground. And we have a university library and an office building from the late 60s and into 1970. And then probably the most unusual building, the Kettering City Hall, which looks like a spaceship. Um, unfortunately, the snow in the picture you can't really see and appreciate it um, fully because of the, con the lack of contrast. Um, I'm going to discuss some non-residential types now. Uh, we saw we surveyed a number of churches and synagogues, and you can see there's a wide variety of styling here um, between these four types that are shown. Banks were one of the first types of buildings that embraced the modern styling. Um, this was because they were trying to get away from the Depression era bad feelings that people had about them, and so they wanted to look different. They didn't want to look like the old um, style of banks. So you'll see a lot of, of modernistic style banks. We saw a number of office buildings. One new type that appeared in this period was the Medical Arts Building. Uh, we had quite a few of those in the survey. They were often two wings joined in, in the center by a, a recessed uh, entrance area and a courtyard. We had some buildings that were two-story office buildings. Some buildings were offices on the second floor and retail on the first floor. And then there were also large multi-story office buildings. Restaurants were often built in unusual, more unusual styles to attract customers. Um, they were appealing to the car culture. In the older days, even in, in the early days of the automobile, people weren't traveling very fast. Um, by the 50s, they were traveling much faster in those cars, and so the, the buildings had to be a lot more distinctive in order to attract people's attention. Usually the, the restaurants were on major roads and had expansive parking in the front, and sometimes they had a drive-in with a canopy as the lower right picture shows you can see the butterfly canopy in the back there. That was a Frisch's Big Boy, which is unfortunately now vacant. Schools were built like crazy because of the expansive growth due to the baby boomer era and the suburbanization. Um, there were various types built. Elementary schools were usually one story with wings with a two-story gym. The wings were in various configurations. Sometimes they were straight, sometimes L-shaped. Uh, we had one round school, as you can see on the upper right. Um, the junior high, or as we now call the middle schools and high schools, also varied in type. Some were compact, like the one on the lower right, lower left. And then this was the era, the beginning of the campus-style high school, where um, buildings were built separately and were joined together by walkways, often covered. This, this era was, uh, the high schools began to look much more like colleges in this era. 
in this uh, building at the lower right is the Fairmont East High School. The Fairmont West High School, which was built a few years earlier, was one of the first campus-style high schools in this part of the country. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Steve Abdikoff, who's going to talk about architectural materials. Thank you, Debbie. I am Steve Abdukov, Principal of Heritage Architectural Associates. Uh, in discussing the materials, um, they played an important role in the style and, and building types of this era. In particular, World War II served as a catalyst for change in the development of, of products and, uh, and research and production technology. Additionally, there was a pent-up demand uh, you know, from the Great Depression you know, beginning in 1929 through the end of World War II, 1945. So these technological developments and in, in these, uh, these issues uh, affected the development of materials. Um, concrete block was a material which we noticed, you can see it in a decorative format with the diamond patterns or in screens and grills. Uh, this was a product which had been in use since the early 20th century. However, by the 1940s, uh, the use of lightweight uh, aggregate facilitated the increased use of this product. It was reliable and of a human scale and easily assembled. Reinforced concrete was a popular material. Uh, it could be treated differently with, uh, with formwork, as you can see with the diagonal forms uh, from Kettering City Hall. Uh, so it was used to um, put in place and, and cured in situ and could be treated differently uh, to accentuate this, the, the type and style of the building. Architectural precast was a material which you developed uh, during this time. Um, it, was, it was popular because it didn't involve curing in the site. It could be produced at a remote location and then assembled in a standardized format. We saw use in decorative um, uh, treatments such as the chevron fins here on, a, on an office building in Dayton. It could also be used structurally such as the double T sections that you see this canopy here. In particular, one of the types of treatments which we noticed in Dayton was exposed aggregate. Now, this was a treatment which was developed by Mosai back in 1938 and was popularized by the 1950s, essentially involved the, the, the pouring of a two-inch concrete slab and, and compacting the finished surface with dense aggregate to provide that rough finish that you see in the lower right-hand corner there. Brick is, is, an, is a traditional building material, however, is used in innovative ways to accentuate the modern style, which involved clean lines, contrasting between horizontality and verticality. So different bonding techniques and projecting uh, alternating bonds stack bonds, particularly which we saw in the use of wing walls in the numerous schools which were built during this era, as well as glazed brick with accents on this warehouse building in the, um, in the um, area of Dayton where that was located. Simulated masonry was uh, a product which was used for veneer. You can see in this commercial application along Salem Avenue or the residential, uh, the, the lower wall here. Uh, this was actually used um, was developed by a company out of Ohio, uh, Hermistone, uh, founded this in 1929 and popularized this technique in, in the 1933 Centennial Progress exhibit in Chicago. Uh, it was essentially distributed by the, by the manufacturer to licensed uh, installers and it consisted of Portland cement, aggregate, and quartz which provided the color and was laid up in site to replicate ashlar stone. Traditional rocks were also used. Uh, one of the styles which was popular involved the use of lava rock facing on buildings such as this motel that you see. Additionally, natural stone was used for large piers such as this, uh, this uh, garden center in South Far Hills, uh, south of Dayton. Thin stone veneer uh, was a technology which evolved during this time. The panels were much thinner than the traditional sections of stone. Uh, manufacturing techniques and anchoring systems allowed them to be applied as veneer panels uh, attached to structural elements behind that. Uh, we see this limestone panel used accent and entrance at Wayne High School in Huber Heights. Additionally, marble and other stones were used in the same treatment in, 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 in panels which were often an inch and a half thick. Aluminum was a product which uh, really um, developed its use after World War II. You know, during World War II, the aviation industry uh, demanded the increased uh, production and increased understanding of the alloy uh, technology. And as a result, after World War II, this product was used substantially due to its lightweight 
uh, characteristics and its uh, resistance to corrosion. You can see it was used here in a, in a panel cladding system on uh, the arena at the University of Dayton. It was often also employed uh, in mullion systems for, such as this church along North Main in Dayton. Porcelain enamel, enamel uh, steel was a product used in spandrel panels that you see here on the right-hand side, as well as the panel cladding system for lustron homes. Additionally, porcelain enamel really became popular after 1949 when the Conier Company out of Niles, Michigan, uh, first adhered the porcelain to an aluminum substrate, and, and this was often used in curtain wall systems of high-rise buildings. Different window types became popular and emerged and contributed to the style of the buildings we saw. You can see the awning windows, which were aluminum and open out casement windows, often uh, steel would open out uh, with being cranked and open out sideways. And we also see banded hopper windows and, and, and glass block, particularly once again in the use of schools that provided uh, a way for light to uh, go into the space but would reflect the glare out. Art glass evolved during this time as well. It's a traditional material, but the uh, evolution of um, epoxies uh, allowed for the, the treatment which became known as Dali de Veri, which you see in this church of St. Rita's Catholic Church in North Main Street in Dayton. Essentially, this was a large panel of uh, the glazing set in epoxy, which would not expand due to the thermal, the resistance of thermal movement. For this. So it allowed for large window wall systems of smaller units of, of glass, which were incorporated in the modern style. Other types of window treatments included clear story windows, which you see in the, uh, the former elementary school, and wi windows which were horizontal bands up at the, at the uh, ceiling level. Also saw full height picture windows in many residential uh, houses. And a particular prominent feature were horizontal band windows at the corners um, a feature of modern styling. As I've mentioned in some of the slides discussing aluminum and, and the term curtain wall, it essentially was a wall system devoid of structural elements. The structure was behind that, but it was basically panels of glass and aluminum or spandrels, which are the, 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 the opaque uh, panels which do not allow the light in. These are used in different uh, locations, such as this entrance of a Masonic temple in Kettering, could be used in horizontal expanses, such as this warehouse building in Dayton, and incorporated with piers, such as this new formula style at St. Clair Community College in Dayton. Similar to the uh, curtain wall systems were storefronts, which were essentially used at entrances of buildings. They could be either recessed, such as what you see here at this entrance to a school, or with porcelain and enamel panels, such as this, uh, this uh, store in uh, Heber Heights. Signage was an important development during this era. Neon and light bulbs were used. Is my favorite sign of the uh, project, the, the candy store in uh, Dayton, which we uh, visited many times. Also, plastic and, a normal, and ornamental metal, uh, such as used for this life insurance sign, were, were incorporated. So those are the materials. Design elements also played an important element into the uh, articulation of forms of buildings. The technological advances we talked about, the use of lightweight materials that were more resistant to corrosion allowed for designers to push the envelope with the use of these new progressive materials. Additionally, uh, designers needed to respond to the automobile, particularly following World War II due to the ex expanded suburban development and, and the incorporation of the interstate highway system. So bold forms in design were used, you know, progressive forward looking to, to capture an audience that was moving and traveling at speeds much, much greater than they were previously. Uh, so these, these elements contribute to the architectural vocabulary of this era. Uh, canopies were prominent and projected from the buildings and they, under, you can see the vibrancy of the forms, whether they were butter, butterfly, a floating canopy of this middle school in the lower left hand corner. Uh, they, they were prominently featured in schools, such as the angled metal supports on the upper right-hand side, as well as the projecting uh, canopy from Dayton Towers, which was clad in a ceramic tile mosaic. Eaves contributed to the bold forms, whether they were stepped and very steep, whether they projected horizontally, which were often the case in schools to provide shading for light, or as well as at corners to accentuate the entrances, such as at this library in North Salem. 
the entrances very much were featured. Uh, the upper left-hand corner shows a stone pier boldly projecting through the horizontal form of the building and clearly demarcating the entrance of the glass storefront entrance system. Uh, the lower left-hand corner, you have an entrance projecting from the main block of the building. And the right-hand image is a uh, commercial building with a floating canopy with the vertical piers projecting through that horizontal plane, reinforcing the vertical verticality of the design. Uh, Pelotes were uh, columns that elevated buildings above the plane. Uh, they were popularized by the French architect Le Corbusier. Uh, some of the buildings that you see here are the, the library from the University of Dayton, the main volume elevated above the quad, uh, a bank building in Oakwood, as well as uh, the uh, former Fairmont East High School in Kettering. Planters were featured. Uh, they could be utilized at entrances uh, and recessed into buildings, as you see in the Trotwood City Hall building on the left, incorporated into uh, residential elements and entrances and, and rooms with large expanses of glazing, as well as at the, uh, the bank building that you see here in a three-dimensional form, um, reinforcing the, the character of the modern language of the architecture. Port car shares were architectural elements which responded directly to the use of the automobile. They provided a place for, for drop-off of pedestrians at churches or banks. Um, and bank tellers and drive-ups were, were elements which evolved following World War II, uh, as well as the uh, port car share that you see here at this dry cleaning uh, on North Main and Dayton to provide protection for the pedestrian as he left his vehicle. Uh, in, in civic arts and, and religious art also articulated and incorporated these forms in, in very clean ways, such as you see in the, in the civic sculptural attachment to the, the main library at the university, uh, or the main city library in Dayton, or relief ornaments such as at the Trinity Lutheran Church on North Main in Dayton. The roof forms incorporated into buildings provided a, a in, an incorporation of the the, the, the form, uh, whether they were low-pitched, incorporating a port cochere, such as the uh, roadside era motel on South Dixie Highway, or a steep projecting forward prow gable of this church on North Main. The roof forms could uh, reinforce the pod characteristics of buildings, such as the geometric roof that you see here at the former Fairmont East High in Kettering, or they could play up the asymmetrical styles of this residence in North Dayton. And finally, in terms of character, the churches that we saw in the synagogues around Dayton were spectacular in terms of their forms and the spires and the towers, which projected upwards into the sky in different, um, using different materials and styles, whether they were lightweight aluminum, whether they were stone piers with three-dimensional relief, or the soaring uh, bell tower and canopy of St. Rita's in North Main. Uh, the, these elements and the others which I showed provided the characteristic features uh, unique that we saw to this modern era. I'm going to turn it over now to Kathy Maskane. Hello. So what does it all mean? In respect, with respect to the Dayton project alone, and actually throughout Ohio, we've only touched the surface with respect to documenting resources from this time period. Intentionally, as a pilot project, it was not comprehensive, but looking at the diversity of types and styles of buildings that were representative of this time period. There's so much more to discover, to document, and the need to expand an awareness of, significant, of the significance of mid-century modern resources. Our research has yielded not only um, the obvious undocumented resources from uh, driving down the streets and throughout the neighborhoods of the Dayton communities and surrounding area, but um, also yielded unknown, unrecognized, and underappreciated information that had the survey project not been conducted uh, would not be known. Huber Heights we know as um, a story of significance with respect to mass production, um, housing development, but it wasn't until this project that we became more aware of how it really is um, stands out in terms of national acclaim related to um, the 
mass production housing um, movement. Hoover Skate Arena on your left side of the screen is one of the first African American owned recreation facilities. And had the research not been conducted and we just relied solely on architectural style and, and materials information, um, this may have continued to be an unknown and unrecognized um, resource. The Cook Field Industrial Park was also um, an interesting surprise. Again, just a very cohesive multi-block complex um, of industrial and office buildings that had architectural distinctiveness and high style influences dating between 1941 and 1968. And these are just examples of the types of things um, that have come to light as a result of the survey project. Other things uh, related to the survey project, uh, it was far from comprehensive as I mentioned and things that we didn't even begin to address were significant interiors. There's knotty pine, naudehyde, and atomic age light fixtures out there um, galore that we perhaps are not aware of um, and are undocumented um, because perhaps the exteriors of resources from this time period have been altered um, and yet some of these interior features um, should be documented as well. And uh, in the year-long project there was no way we could comprehensively cover every neighborhood uh, in the Dayton and surrounding area and so that there's many, many other neighborhoods um, where documentation has not occurred. Likewise, Nathalie mentioned the significance um, of interviewing individuals, um, which is one of the aspects of documenting and researching mid-century modern resources is that there are people living who are actively involved in the construction, design, and implementation of these resources. And furthermore, there are many businesses whether they be developers, home builders, um, or designers who have archives um, that are um, at our access as researchers to uh, peruse. So one of the major distinctions between doing research on properties that date to this time period compared to um, 19th century resources, say. Clearly more research needs to be done. Um, just through the one project in Dayton, we divulged um, works by architects of not only local but also state and national significance, including an Edward Durrell stone building out of New York City, um, the Sinclair Community College, and uh, St. Rita's Catholic Church on the right-hand side was designed by Elmer Schmidt of Cincinnati, and then Allen Hall at Wright State was designed by local architects Lorenzo and Williams. So through this process one can better understand the impact of designers on the built environment in a single community. And um, we didn't begin to exhaust um, certain building types for which there was a plethora. Um, we could have done probably a survey of all 500 buildings just doing ecclesiastical properties. There were uh, through the suburbanization and growth of that time period, um, there were so many of these constructed and each had its own distinctive characteristics and design features. So uh, one could focus more thoroughly on religious properties alone and or um, another category of buildings that we came across was medical office buildings. Um, which kind of piqued our curiosity that many of them, although focused around hospital areas, um, also just seemed to be something about the profession and um, the medical profession alone in terms of how doctors were serving the public, that there was um, a wide breadth of this type of building as well as other professional buildings. So in addition to um, doing more and documenting more and ways in which we can better nurture and take care of our historic resources from this time period, there are multiple tools to, um, that are not foreign to those of us working in preservation, but um, the National Register is certainly one tool that can work to help create an awareness for uh, properties from this time period but likewise local designation, which then can um, uh, enable design review and local controls over historic resources from this time period. 
as we evaluated these resources and looked at issues such as integrity and significance, um, it became apparent that actually there's no difference um, in terms of how one interprets the criteria for the National Register, whether we're looking at buildings that were built in 1850 or looking at buildings that were built in 1950. The uh, criteria is essentially unchanged. This is a significant um, piece of it information as communities particularly involved in Section 106 and uh, reviewing compliance issues um, because of the quantity of buildings built from this time period, it's important that we understand um, that, that the criteria is applied just the same. That um, if there are character defining features in, say, a single family home and those features are still intact, then that contributes to the significance of that building. Likewise, in a district, the environmental, the streetscape, the curbing, the layout, um, those are all things that one would look at to help assess National Register eligibility. So whether um, a house is architect designed or not, or a building, that, for example, if the windows, um, such as a uh, um, uh, in a ranch house are a character defining feature. They were sliders or casement or whatever design was actually employed and originally built. If those windows have been replaced with some kind of a replacement window that changes either the dimension or the materials, it may in fact affect the integrity to the extent that um, the significance is compromised and perhaps those buildings are not um, at eligible or as significant. Likewise, commercial buildings, as seen in these pictures, whether it's the porcelain enamel steel. The example on the top is uh, uh, one of the medical office buildings I mentioned to you that were so well preserved and so predominant with um, porcelain enamel steel buildings and stainless ribbing and signage that was all period um, original to something like the motel, which you saw before in Steve's presentation, with the Port Cashier where the windows have all been boarded up and there's been significant alteration to that elevation, at least on the on streetscape, um, those are the types of things that one would evaluate in um, looking at National Register eligibility. So in order to uh, further nurture, develop, and document historic resources from the mid-century period, we need to get more people engaged and broaden the audience for um, and educate an audience for a better appreciation of these resources. Um, in, across the country, we've learned that young professionals um, as a um, population sector have found that this particular time period has an appeal and many people have, uh, local historical societies or organizations have created affinity groups um, that have increased the educational component about mid-century modern within that population. Local AIA chapters, city planning departments, home builders associations, all are potential um, resources to utilize and work with to hold educational programs and expand an awareness. So the bottom line, we need to do more. We need to find more resources to expand um, this kind of documentation in other areas. Um, when planning a survey project, if you're one of those communities where your resources have not yet been documented, uh, things to think about are how to define the parameters of the resource. For instance, the Dayton, the Ohio Modern Dayton Survey Project was distinctive in that we chose to look at all different types of buildings, um, not just residential, not just commercial, and from all um, sectors of, of development quality and scale. So they weren't necessarily just architect design, single family houses, um, but we wanted to look at the whole range of what was typical for that time period, whether um, regardless. Um, of the builder, the quality, the materials, the budget, etc. And we believe that that is actually one of the values of this survey project that sets it apart because um, it hasn't um, been isolated or selective about the kinds of things that we surveyed. What this does has created a context to better evaluate 
mid-century modern resources on a uh, local, statewide, or actually national basis, building, um, adding to that archive of understanding about mid-century modern resources. So until you know what's out there, um, do you really know how significant it is within your own local context or broader context, such as Huber Heights? When we looked at it, we learned that really it was um, outstanding within a national scope, um, but would not have known that had we looked, not looked beyond the, the date and parameters. So you want to um, define what your parameters are going to be. Your date range may vary depending on the settlement patterns within your own community and defining the area where you do the survey project, focusing perhaps on transportation routes, development patterns, and other major influences that did impact the development in this time period in your community. So in conclusion, time is of the essence. These resources from the recent past are threatened. The threat is rampant, the neglect, the demolition. People see them as disposable. Um, perhaps not historic, they're too youthful. They're not recognized as being scarce because they're too plentiful. And they're um, misunderstood or not understood due to the materials that Steve talked about, the plastics, the concrete, things that perhaps in our general vocabulary about the built environment we don't think of as being historic. And disinvestment, disinvestment, excuse me, in neighborhoods as commercial strips and neighborhoods transition in and out of popularity is having a significant impact on these recent past resources. Other types of things that we take for granted or drive by or wish away, depending on your opinion, are things like slip covers, as we call them, that were added to um, late 19th, early 20th century buildings, um, which admittedly, when they were added, might have been viewed as being intrusive to the original facade. But it's not unlike a 20th century classical revival porch being added to a late 19th century Victorian home. These items and pieces and components of the built environment um, are achieving significance in their own right. Signage as well is another example. Roadside motels, restaurants, movie theaters, those um, resources that are automo automobile era novelties um, are disappearing quickly. And then schools, as Debbie mentioned, and several others have talked about the schools. Um, there's a predominance of them in Dayton that are disappearing quickly. And a lot of this is um, due to the um, state um, school funding mechanism, uh, which is skewed to favor new construction. So citywide communities like Dayton or Hubert Heights have made the decision district-wide to demolish their school buildings and replace them with new. Um, but unfortunately, what's happening, it's not just the loss of a single building, but that many were built concurrent and integral with a neighborhood, leaving a hole in the neighborhood. And simply within the time period from when we constructed or did the survey project, um, and, and then within that year's time of putting the presentation together, um, many things already were beginning to disappear or become vacant um, or be demolished. So love it or hate it, or whether you're indifferent to it, we, ne we need to recognize that this era had significant impact on the built environment and that it represents an important chapter in, in our country's history. Much remains to be studied to create that meaningful context to better understand what of these resources we should be protecting and preserving for the future. You need to, again, I'll reiterate, you need to know the extent of what you have to determine what, what should be preserved. And this is particularly relevant to those communities faced with uh, the impact of federal funding on some of these neighborhoods and um, commercial districts. So much of what remains is valuable and it merits additional research and documentation and designation. Preserving these resources must be added to our preservation agenda. From restrained modernist offices to the artistic forms of brutalism and neo-expressionism to the soaring angles of googie buildings and signs to the rambling ranch house the architecture of the mid-20th century has much to be celebrated and preserved. 
Our challenge and job ahead is to expand the awareness and move recent past resources to the top of our priority list on the preservation agenda. Now, Natalie, Steve, Debbie, and I will entertain your questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and we'd particularly like to thank uh, Debbie and Steve and Natalie and Kathy for today for doing this, particularly Steve and Debbie for driving all the way over here to Columbus today. Um, this was a really great presentation. Um, you guys can start sending in your questions now. Uh, send your questions to me, Devin, on the screen, and we'll be taking questions just in a moment. Um, we're just going to take a moment uh, to remind you guys, first of all, uh, if any of you are AIA members and would like credit for today's presentation, uh, please email me. I'll put it up on the screen, but it's dmiles, D-M-I-L-E-S, at heritageohio.org. It's my email address. Um, please email me to let me know that you would like credit, and also if you would like a certificate of completion with that today. Please give me your mailing address as well, and I'll get that mailed out to you this week. Um, and Heritage Ohio, once again, would like to thank you for attending today. Um, if you enjoyed today's webinar, please think about becoming a member of Heritage Ohio, and you can find more about that on our website at heritageohio.org. Um, and finally, uh, our next webinar coming up is going to be on January 4th. Uh, look forward to that uh, coming in your email. Um, and there will be a, two surveys coming to you, uh, one about today's presentation and also a final end of the year survey. Yeah, we could love to get your input on that, how you've been enjoying them, how what you've liked, what you've not liked, and what topics you'd like to have us cover in the future. So to start off with questions, uh, we're going to pass the microphone so there might be a little delay in between me asking a question and when it's answered. Uh, the first one was why Wimpy wasn't demolished. Whoever would like to take that one. I'm not sure what the question is referring to. The, the Wimpy has continued to serve as a fast food restaurant. When we started the project, it wasn't a Wimpy's as part of that chain, but it was operating as a burger joint, um, lottery, place to purchase, lottery tickets, etc. But by the time we ended the project, the building was vacant. And it seems to me the last time I was in Dayton that someone, I'm not sure if it's still vacant or not. It's, used. It, yeah. it's in use. So in, it's a restaurant use. Um, so if you're suggesting it should have been demolished. Right. So if you are suggesting why wasn't it demolished, um, it's a great little building. And to see it in person, it's very charming. It maintains historic integrity. All the porcelain enameled steel panels are in great shape. The colors are original. Uh, door fixtures uh, on the handles. Um, it, it's really in pretty sharp condition with respect to historic integrity. Our next question is coming from Mary. and She's asking a question about small communities. How can small communities begin to inventory these structures and raise an appreciation for them? Well, I think the most important thing to do is to start um, using the existing tool. I don't know um, what state you're in, but your state preservation office probably has an inventory tool like the Ohio Historic Inventory that Ohio uses. Become familiar with that and the kinds of information that's collected on it. And um, if you've got working through a local um, historical society or a preservation organization, um, pull together a core of people who have some interest in that, do some training on architectural terminology from this time period, and, um, and actually wanted to mention that the Ohio Modern Survey Report, in, in completion, not just the Dayton survey component, but also the piece that was done on statewide context, is available online from the Ohio Historic Preservation Office website. There's lots of information there, including Steve's research on the various materials from this time period and styles that Debbie talked about. So pull a, a group of people together and um, just at least at a minimum start doing photographic documentation. You might work with your local media to see if they wouldn't be willing to showcase some of those and start gathering um, uh, creating a curiosity 
and then gathering information and collecting and starting an archive. Okay, uh, Anthony has a question about a building. Uh, he wants to know who the architect was on the Kettering City Hall, if anyone knows that. <laughs> we do know that. I'm blanking on the name. Um, Eugene Betts. Oh, Debbie. <laughs> he did a number of buildings in Kettering and South Dayton. We did uh, at least one other building that we surveyed that Betts designed. His office building. And also including his office building, which Steve can talk about in a little more detail. Well, I was actually going to talk a little bit more about the City Hall building, which recently, when we were documenting the uh, that that site, was actually under uh, renovation and was a sensitive. Uh, I think it's a good example of a sensitive adaptive use or continuing use renovation, where the the essence of the building was retained, you know, from from the modern era, but it was incorporated, uh, you know, lead, uh, which is leadership and environment, and or leadership and energy design. Uh, you know, features, uh, and it was made handicap accessible, but yet the essence of the building was retained. You know, the, the, uh, the open council chambers, which, which opened out towards the stained glass um, uh, window, the, the essence of the house was retained. So I think it's important that these, to, to commend that building and, and, that, and that team for that, uh, and for that project and the way that they recognized the essence of the building uh, and, and incorporated that into a rehabilitation. Thank you guys. Um, we're going to give you guys a couple more minutes to send any final questions in. Uh, there is a question, a couple questions actually, um, about if anyone can access the survey to see it uh, online or uh, in person. I'll let you guys uh, tell them where it's at. Yeah, I would, whoops, I would Google um, Ohio Historical Society. It's ohiohistory.com is the website, excuse me, ohiohistory.org. And um, if you have any trouble accessing the report and the information, you can contact the Ohio Historic Preservation Office at 614-298-2000, and they can maybe walk through with you how to get there. Thank you, Kathy. Um, give you guys a couple more moments uh, to send any final questions in. Um, if there are not any more questions coming in, uh, we thank everyone for attending today. And definitely we want to thank again Steve, Debbie, Kathy, and Nathalie for coming over here today. Uh, this was a great presentation, one of the best we've had so far. So thank you guys for coming today. Um, and we have, let me see, is this a question? Yes, we do have one more question. Um, another question from Mary. Um, she's talking about her region where she's at, um, and the region has uh, different types of architecture, and it's... Uh, centering on uh, technology, um, how, how do other parts of the country view this type of architecture, mid-century modern? Is everyone on board to appreciate this yet, or have people been tearing it down in mass? I would just say yes, yes. yes. <laughs> That's a great question. I think it truly does just vary depending on where you live. Uh, my suspicion is that in larger cities, people might be more interested in it, um, or maybe university towns. As Kathy mentioned earlier, there is a resurgence of interest in this era, not just architecture, but via TV shows such as Mad Men, um, the new show on ABC, Pan Am. I think people are just tuning into this era as being almost a new discovery. Uh, and it's attracting maybe a younger audience to preservation. Uh, having said that, certainly areas in California and uh, Florida are more in tune to modernism maybe than some communities in the Midwest, and I suspect Steve also has some thoughts about modernism in Miami in particular. Kathy, move the mic over here. I was just going to reiterate Natalie's main point. I think the challenge here in Ohio versus in some areas such as Florida or California or Arizona, which were developed largely during this era, uh, they have an appreciation for it because to them this, you know, this really is historic stuff. You know, and there aren't the added layers like you have in Ohio where the history dates from the late 18th century or mid 18th century 
and, and the, uh, the sense is, well, if it's not 19th century or early 20th, it's not historic. So I think in some of these other areas, particularly I'm familiar with Miami, uh, there is a, a large effort to really document these resources to start designating uh, both individually and in districts and adaptively reuse these. So um, I think that's a particular challenge we have here in Ohio is to raise awareness and education as, yeah, they're another layer. They're an important layer, particularly here in Ohio, of the heyday of the manufacturing era, you know, when Ohio boomed in, the, in, the, in this time. So they're important. And we have one final question, and Scott from Oklahoma just wants you to reiterate the phone number for the Ohio Historical Preservation Office. That I can do. Area code 614-298-2000, and it's ohiohistory.org. And that concludes today's webinar. Uh, thank you all for attending today, and thank you again to our presenters. Um, and you can find the next webinar on January 4th at 1 o'clock. Thank you.